Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces Part 1, Stratton Dreams Book 1, Desolation's Tears Read by the author Chapter 6, Last Call The chaotic, angry scuffle within the back alley cul-de-sac reverberated throughout the structures of redemption quite unlike any other activity occurring upon that frigid desolation morning. The lone survivor of the life pod crash was drawn by such commotion. It slithered and leapt its way from rooftop to rooftop, pausing only occasionally to reassess its bearings through the vibrations it perceived through the snow-capped roof beneath its long, taloned feet. The viscous oil secreted from its bio-lubricated joints oozed in gooey droplets to the snow, which it dissolved through instantly to pool upon the rooftop. Its instinct was to never remain in one spot for long, while its gnawing hunger prompted its senses to search less for physical vibrations, but hunt more for the anger and hostility that psychically permeated the city, seemingly carried upon the atmosphere of desolation itself. Yet by the time it peered its head over the roof edge to peruse the blind alley below, the violence that had called to it had ended. There was still minimal activity between two to three figures, but a resonance of greater anger and fear soon drew it away in pursuit of a more alluring banquet. Com-fed flash shield officers Stanks and Lobral left the hangar district, having just delivered the bad news of a lost freighter and crew to whom they'd assumed was the grieving family unit. As usual, they'd had no consolation to offer, as they'd been given no information beyond the basic facts. The lucky strike had been left derelict in a deteriorating orbit, abandoned by all hands presumed lost. As flash cops went, Stanks and Lowbrow ranked near the bottom of their law enforcement division, denied any official transport unit of their own due to budgetary restrictions, and yet dispatched throughout the four corners of Redemption to serve as couriers or escorts. Lebrow usually blamed their predicament on the sour attitude of his shorter partner, while Stanks typically accepted the accusation without counter, as he didn't want to create a hostile atmosphere on the job. Stanks felt they could have successfully argued for a transport that particular day, save for all the morning's chaos thus far. From overnight military activity out on the ice, to the pre-dawn murder of an otherwise mundane public representative, in this case, the planetary biologist. Violence and death were common on a mining world, but civil servants weren't usually on the receiving end. Such was atypical for redemption, as the city and its denizens were more actively engaged in preparing for the onset of desolation's most brutal season, deepest winter. Or as the locals like to call it, frozen hell. Every two years, the perpetual night above would oversee conditions so harsh the entire population of the Northern Hemisphere would be driven underground for the following five months, as even the spaceport would be forced to close by a glacier-like coating of ice that would cap the pole nearly 30 meters thick. Only frozen hell was still days away, while the curious thaw long called Desolation's Tears, which always preceded it, hadn't even begun. That shaken Pris played us, Lobral fumed, as the pair of flash shields crossed the border road that separated the hangar district from the city proper. You're not still going on about that infotech, Stank said, giving his taller partner a sideways glance. Their earlier assignment had left them out in the cold and literally holding all the infotech's bags. As they were on record for the requisition, 
whatever damage the equipment sustained would be compensated for out of their payroll. Talitha Masters had apparently saddled them with broken equipment, which would now be replaced under the general Flash Shield budget, or specifically their salaries. Lebrow could rant until he'd exhausted his voice, but Stanks understood this was how the Confed bureaucratic game was played up and down the strata. Just wait till she tries pulling her shike on Drexler! Lowbrow said, seemingly fantasizing some over-the-top retribution right there on the spot. Yeah, those flash guard don't take shike like that from nobody! Well, we did drag her out of bed, Stanks rationalized. I'd have been pretty annoyed at us, too. Where does she get off treating sanctioned confed personnel like she's better than us? Lowbrow continued his imagined confrontation. Maybe because she's confed too? Stanks offered. Lebrow stopped but waited until Stanks paused, then glanced back over his shoulder. The taller officer stepped forward, looming over the smaller man, before sticking his finger in his partner's face. Why the shike are you siding with her? He spat. Stank stared in momentary surprise, then caught Lebrow's wrist before the bigger officer could slap him. Lebrow tried once to yank his arm away, but Stanks held firm. He glared at the smaller man who didn't seem to know his diminutive place in the larger pecking order. A nearby scream caught both officers before either could escalate their spat beyond their current expressions of defensive inadequacy. The cry, more like a shriek, came from the open door to a small parts foundry that supplied the nearby hangar district with swift custom service for freighters in a hurry. A woman burst through the door but never actually made it outside before something yanked her back in. The shrieking became a prolonged wail and didn't seem as if it would stop any time soon. Lobrow radioed their position and report while Stanks unholstered his sidearm and ran for the open door. Lobrow was behind him almost immediately. Only one of the pair made it back out alive. This has been Brian J. L. Glass's Dark Spaces. Book One, Desolation's Tears. Read by the author. Audio and video production by A.J. Blackburn. Original music composed and performed by Frankie Caffrey. Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces and BJLG's Dark Spaces are copyright 2022 by Brian J.L. Glass.